Hey, what is up, guys? This is the Leafs Combo Podcast for August 8, 2019. I'm Norman James in London, Ontario, joined as always by my podcast partner in crime and more, the one and only Michael <laughs> Piagello. Michael, how are you? Good morning, Norman. Uh, I am well. Um, it is not too hot in Buffalo in mm-hmm. August, which is a beautiful thing. I know that some places... Um, when I visited Yankee Stadium about 10 days ago, it was 100, oh my. Uh, 100 degrees with a heat index of 106. So I, needless to say, it was like visiting a, a sauna in the Bronx. My wife woke me up this morning and said, do you know it's going to be 22 tomorrow? Celsius. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. that sounds great. That's freezing. It's the middle <laughs> of the summer. I'm like, you know what? We needed a reprieve uh, long ago from the heat. And we're finally getting one. It's it's nice, cool rain right now in LDN, by the way. Um, is Mike Babcock raining on his own limited parade here, Mike, with comments he made to Matt Larkin? Well, and, and this is the thing. It's tough to get a full analysis of what he was saying. Quote, uh, that was, that was you know, a photo was taken off, of, off of a computer posted on Twitter. So it was a full quote of Babcock talking about the usage of Austin Matthews and, uh, and uh, John Tavares. And her phrase, he was like, well, use him. I'd like to use him ideally around 19 minutes a night. Uh, some games it'll be 20. Some games it'll be 18. It'll yeah. fluctuate. But this, and this is the thing with – I understand the management of time when you have two number one centers, basically during the regular season, you don't want to overuse them only maybe when your team is behind, but this is sort of a dog whistle when it comes to Babcock and what happened last year. The main criticism about him was usage was especially uh, Austin Matthews in game seven behind, you know, three to one where he, he uses him six minutes in the third period as opposed to William Nylander, who's not a center, who he used for six minutes. You need to rely on your big guys, and you need to over, over not even overwork them. And this is sort of symbolic of that he's not going to do that. Now, you can't. You have to wait until the regular season to see how he divvies up ice time. But I, I have to tell you that if he does that, and if he goes into the playoffs, and he does what he did last year, he won't be around after next year. Is he waiting to throw Chris Draper over the boards and have him eat up minutes too? Is 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 he is he coaching the Red Wings at peak, or is he coaching the Maple Leafs now in a crucial situation where it's time to uh, use what you have, the best of what you have, get the best mm-hmm. out of what you have, and go forward? This guy seems like, in a way, that he's living in the past. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and that's where I think he, there has to be a, a a sort of change of philosophy, and we'll see if he's open to that or not. I mean, this is an this comment is an indicator that he's not, and you also have to factor in that okay, Nazem Kadri is not here any longer, and Alex Kerfoot I think is a good young center, and maybe uh, early on they'll taper his ice time until he has more confidence in him. But I think he's a capable number three center. And you don't have a liability at fourth line center any longer. You, you'll have Jason Spezza. And ideally, you know, I think the, the plan is he's going to play 10 minutes a night. He's going to take face offs. He's, you know, it's not somebody like Freddie Gauthier who you have to, you know, I, ideally manage time with mm-hmm. because he's not a good, he's overall not a good player. So, I, I mean, I think Babcock, you know, maybe he waits till training camp. Maybe he discovers what he has on hand and he'll adjust accordingly. But in the playoffs next year, when they get there, if Tavares and Matthews are not playing 20 minutes a night, at least something's wrong. Words mm-hmm. matter, Mike. Should Mike Babcock be using these words in this matter? Or should this guy essentially be saying, look, training camp's just around the corner. We're working things out. We plan on using our assets uh, as professionally and as strategically as possible. Buckle up. Wait to find out how it works out. Yeah, I think he should hold his cards a little closer to the vest. But if this is truly what he believes, that this is, you know, this is a reflection of, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, I, I, I respect him for being truthful, but I also think that he's doing it at his own peril because if this team fails and he doesn't, change with the times 
then I, then it's going to be a situation where I think he could lose his job. Babcock knows that um, the pitfall of what could be to come is unemployment. It's not as if he's not going to have an income or he's not going to have an opportunity to go anywhere else. So could there be a bit of posturing here and, um, you know, publicly stating what he wants to do and how he's going to do it, um, regardless of uh, where this may take him, Mike? Could we be seeing um, maybe a last stand from uh, Mr. B? And, um, you know, it's kind of my way or the highway. Yeah, I'll make some alterations. But at the end of the day, uh, I'm the head coach. I'm one of the best in the business. I'll do it the way I see fit. And the cards will fall where they may. Yeah, I I think he has supreme confidence in himself and his ability to to win if given the amount of talent. And, you know, he has a certain philosophy and I think he's going to stick with that. But but again, that has not been what has been sold to, you know, Leaf fans. Uh, they, they, They expect based on, you know, the like the players that they've traded for and the failures of the last three years in the postseason that a Stanley Cup and Olympic gold medal winning coach is going to change in some way and evolve to reflect the team that he has on hand. I'm not going to judge completely until we see what happens during the regular season, and this much might this might be much ado about nothing. But all I say is, you know, coming on the heels of what happened in the playoffs and how he's managed Austin Matthews over the last few years. And, you know, the, frankly, the, I think Matthews has sort of had problems with that. I think he wants to expand his role. He wants to be a leader. You know, maybe that means him him being team captain as soon as this year, but that is Mm -hmm. a frustration for a guy who's one of the best players in the league. And I think, I'm not saying that the players should run the show because they never will under Babcock, but you want your best players out there and they should be out there more. Yeah. This is the Leafs combo, Norman James with Mike Agello. The assumption would be Matt Austin Matthews remains a Maple Leaf longer than the head coach. Should, should we not feel like Austin Matthews was drafted to be a Maple Leaf from the start of his career until the finish of it and along the way having one rookie of the year maybe a couple of hearts a con Smythe, a few cups that's the process here mike babcock is the head coach to facilitate uh and um empower his players so if he loses sight of that and let's hope he hasn't but if he loses sight of that and begins to you know worship himself and feel like uh, he's embattled and, you know, things are collapsing around him and he's just going to do it his way. It's just going to be a cluster F U C K uh, this coming season. And, and Mike, yeah. um, the, the, the other point I wanted to make here is look, Mike Babcock, if he changed his ways and just decided to, you know, alter how he does business, um, be more agreeable, be, be more likable, um, uh, generate true trust and respect from his players, then that, that would be great. But again, you can't really treat it. You can't really teach an old dog new tricks. So that's where this Sheldon Keefe idea comes in. That's where the Sheldon Keefe hope comes in. And for as much as I feel Mm -hmm. like Sheldon Keefe um, isn't a better coach than Mike Babcock and he's not, he doesn't have the magic elixir. He is not the player whisperer. He will probably come in and identify better with the players. Yes, youth is, would be part of it, but um, the, a, if a fresh face, uh, a, a, an ear that is listening more to what the guys want to do would be beneficial. And as time goes on, um, and if Mike Babcock and this Leafs group do not um, coalesce and come together and, and, and produce, you're going to hear more uh, from me in regards to wanting more Sheldon Keefe and eventually wanting him behind the Maple Leafs bench. Because as the OGs know, Michael, you and I are extremely steadfast and consistent in our belief in the Leafs, not Leafs, right? We believe in the team and what it takes for this team to win. And I will put any of my favorites 
out to pasture for new favorites if it means benefiting the team and ultimately getting this team to where it needs to be and needs to be soon. The last team standing in the NHL hoisting that damn cup. And I think that Kyle Dubas is sort of in a, in a, in a mind such as you and, and I are in terms of implementing change with this roster. What he's done over the last couple of years has been to not bring back Babcock favorites who he has overplayed and overplayed. You don't see Ron Hainsey on this roster any longer. You don't see Nikita Zaitsev or Leo Komarov. You know, you see younger players. You see them trading for Tyson Berry. Uh, trading for Cody CC, and it's going to force Babcock to use these players. I mean, either that or find new favorites and find his new version mm-hmm. of Ron Hainsey who will overplay yeah. for 22 or 23 minutes a night. And let's just hope it's not Martin Marinson. Yeah, yeah well, I, did, you know, don't we want to learn? Don't we want to become better? Don't we want to expand our horizons? Doesn't a guy like Mike, you know, if you, you, there's an, in Hollywood, the aging stars go get Botox and plastic surgery and they go do yoga and they do Pilates and all this stuff because they start to feel like the younger generation is getting more face time. They're getting more opportunities. And um, you see it all the time, Mike, I don't have to point any uh, legendary actress or actor out um, that has tried to remodel themselves and make themselves look younger. Sometimes it looks good subtly. Sometimes they look like a surprise catfish. Um, it is what it is, but you understand that there's this feeling of, of um, heat coming from the, from the younger generation. Right. Um, and so I, essentially it's uh, what can I do to stay relevant? Um, and and we, we get that, we get that all the time. I, I think... So in sports, what can guys like Mike mm-hmm. Babcock do? Who's not an old fart, but is no. pro- projecting old fartness. What can a guy like that do to stay relevant? Because you, no one is guaranteed anything all the time and everything all the time, right? Well, like, what can he do to stay relevant? Everyone else is trying to stay relevant. This guy just seems like he is tr- just staying himself. That doesn't mean he's relevant. Well, I, I, I think that I think that you know, coaches believe in what they believe in. Sometimes they'll take on new, uh, new techniques, and, and I don't think Babcock is opposed to or not open to that. But it, it you know. In, in general, he, he is what he is. I think the only thing that you're going to see in terms of an implementation of change is A, based on the roster, and B, based on the coaching staff. A guy like Paul McFarland, who they brought in from Florida, who's a young assistant coach who had a lot of success with the Panthers, especially managing their power play. You might see some changes on, this, on the Leafs' power play this year that you might not expect. You could see Tyson Berry quarterbacking the power play instead of Morgan Riley because they may need Morgan Riley to play more five on five than on special teams. You may see uh, Andreas Janssen replacing Nazem Kadri as the guy in front on the power play because Kadri is obviously in Colorado. Mm-hmm. I don't think it'll be William Nylander because he doesn't sort of fit that position. So, and I don't think they want to put Austin Matthews in front of the net to take a pounding. So a guy like Janssen or a guy like Kapanen or somebody of that nature might mix into the first power play. So those ch- kind of changes, I think, come from things other than Babcock, but it's from his staff. So that might be something that helps this team. Move mm-hmm. forward. Look, we're talking about this as if it is going to be an obstruction to success. Babcock being one way, the players wanting something else. I think Babcock and this team will still eclipse the 100 point mark. They could vie for an Eastern Conference title the way they are. But it, will it be enough at this point of the evolution of this team under the Mike Babcock tenure? This team should have a purpose and a direction it's headed uh, with unanimity across the board. Don't you think, Mike, that that's, that was the point in the beginning? When that guy took the podium and said, here's what I want to do with this cast of characters that will be coming aboard, um, all these years later, the team should literally be there. So any sort of um, infighting or any uh, dissension is unfortunate. It's not as if it's foreign to this process, but it doesn't help 
in any way. And yeah, we're talking about it like, um, you know, you have the, the crusty old coach and all these kids who just want the shackles taken off. It's deeper than that. Um, there's, there's more to it than that. And again, this team could still be very successful. But time's a ticking, man. Time's a ticking on Babcock. Time's a ticking on, on these kids. Uh, it's about getting together, becoming a cohesive unit, and winning championships, man. Listen, Mitch Marner, before we go, um, mm -hmm. he still hasn't been signed to uh, Magnitogorsk. Uh, the, the father's <laughs> still the father. The agent's still the agent. The Leafs are still where they are. I guess no news is standard and typical and just yeah i mean we're in the dog days right now because you're a, a little over a month well yeah about a month away from the opening of training camp the rookie tournaments would be happening a month from now and then training camp would open in mid-september um ideally you want marner signed before then it could bleed into training camp which i think will be a sideshow i mean the thing is is that and i i you know we've talked about this on on the buzzcast about how and I don't think Marner and his impasse with the Leafs is having as much of an effect as people think, but there's just sort of a log jam of all of these RFAs and they're waiting for one player to sort of set the market and then everybody would adjust accordingly. And James Myrtle wrote a pretty good piece in the athletic last week regarding, you know, what's going on with the negotiations with Marner and, this, you know, this is where Darren Ferris, I think, has a lot to do with this scenario. And he has a reputation of having his players hold out to get what they want. Two of them that he recently has done that with was Athena CU with Detroit and Josh Anderson with uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets. And in both instances, he waited until with, with Athena CU, he waited into the regular season and ended up not getting him anything more than a one year deal for like a million three, which was. You know, he was looking for a long-term deal. He didn't get that until the following year when he put up another good season. Anderson waited until right before the regular season started, got a three-year deal at less than $2 million. Um, so he, th these players didn't get the, the windfall that they thought they were going to get. Now, Marner is different because he's led the Leafs in scoring twice, and I think – they're pushing for uh, a long term. They're pushing for a uh, a deal where they get the most money for the least amount of years. If you look at Myrtle's piece, he said, "Well, the Leafs have offered eight years at ten million. That was rebuffed." Uh, the Marner camp responded with basically, "Hey, give us the Austin Matthews deal." The Leafs said, "No, thank you." The the Leafs appear open to a three year bridge deal. But then Darren Ferris comes out and and basically says, "Okay, we'll take what you're giving us on an eight year deal." in terms of AAV, meaning 10 million bucks on a three-year deal. Uh, excuse me, the, Brit, the biggest bridge deal in the history of the NHL was Nikita Kucherov, and this was three, I think three years ago, at 4.7 million for three years. Mitch Marner may break eight. He's not breaking oh, 10 man. on a three-year bridge deal, and that, and that is where the impasse is. I think eventually it'll get to that three-year point, because I don't think he wants to lock him up, lock himself up for six or seven. I think he wants to hit another big home run financially on a shorter after a shorter term deal. But ten million is fantasy land, and Darren Ferris has got to wake up and realize that he's not going to get that. And once that happens, then I think it'll get done fairly. I'd like quick. to know what their strategy is here, their end game. Where do they think the Leafs will stop? Where can Team Marner? Uh, reconcile the struggle and just deal with it. You, you'd hope there's a process here, Mike, uh, or, you know, Darren Ferris has done this before to some success to, um, you know, a lack of success in other circumstances. The guy can't be throwing numbers out on a whim. And if for as much as he's solely focused on where he thinks Marner is and his status in the league and not necessarily taking into account everything else, the guy has to have some sort of a plan here because the way this is playing out right now, it seems reckless, um, not only uh, in this moment, uh, but it seems like it's going to be a detriment to uh, Mitch Marner's season ahead, and it's certainly not going to help the Maple Leafs do what they need to do. So let's start winding this thing down here, bud. Yeah, I, I think that I think you're, you're right, but I think that the thing is is that Kyle Dubas has nobody else to blame but himself for this because they they capitulated on Nylander last year and gave him basically what he wanted. 
uh, after, you know, after holding out for two months or mm-hmm. an impasse for two months. And they gave Austin Matthews everything he wanted, a shorter term five year deal for a, an amount that was more conducive to a long term mm-hmm. seven or eight year deal. So, Marner, you know, Ferris is hoping that Dubas will crush under the pressure. And, and that he'll succumb and he'll give him what he wants. I don't think that that's the case. I think he has to send a message, not to the point that the, that Marner is not going to come back, but he knows that Marner wants to play in Toronto and to pl- pay, play in Toronto and to get a shorter term deal. He's going to have to take a little bit less, mm-hmm. but that's getting there is going to be the top. <laughs> this is, it's bizarre. It's, it's not as if Mitch Marner has a multitude of places to land and go. It's not as if, Hey, Leafs, if you don't want this guy, he's off to destination A, B, C, D, Z. There, the options aren't a plenty for, for Marner. So a lot of this stuff is just posturing and nonsense. If this thing goes into the season, it just doesn't look good for anyone. It doesn't, and, and at, the, at, at the core, it's, it, it's, it makes Marner, um, I mean, he's going to look bad, right? Um, but a lot of that <laughs> is directed to Paul Marner. If you thought that Michael Nylander was uh, hated, uh, Paul Marner is, is not um, anybody's friend except for a few people, and he deserves it. It's just he just he just deserves it, and the agent's just not much of a better person either. Um, but they're doing what they need to do because they think Mitch Marner has been treated like shit his entire life, and nobody's respected him, and nobody's loved him because it's little man syndrome that the dad has. And the agent, I don't know what the hell they're drinking. But um, again, at the end of the day, the, this hurts Marner more than it really hurts anybody else. And if it goes into the season, like I was saying, and he's missing time, that's, those are stats he's not compiling for his legacy. That, those are stats he's not compiling for the team. Those are games and minutes that he's not playing that he needs to get on to, to get up to speed and up to pace, right? Mitch Marner is a better player than William Nylander every single day of the week. He is a better player than Austin Matthews on many a night. He is one of the most naturally gifted players in in the league. He is unbelievable. The kid has a lot of potential, right? Beyond what the potential he's shown. But not playing, missing out, going through this nonsense, coming back and maybe not having his head right if things do um, get nasty and you know he goes back into a locker room that where he feels odd and and if he follows the same sort of blueprint and trying to get back up to speed uh that Nylander um you know obviously tried and failed to do it's just not good for him at all and it's it sucks because um a lot of this shit can just be avoided by accepting the reality of the situation these two these two parties are most likely going to be coming together at some point and when they do and the, tra- the trail of destruction has to be cleaned up behind them. They'll be asking themselves, was it all worth it? For sure, Darren Ferris will think it is. But for, for the Leafs, um, you know, there'll be a lot of uh, re- reflection. Last word to you. Uh, the only other thing that uh, was notable this week was the signing of Kevin Shattenkirk in Tampa after being bought out by the Rangers. The Leafs apparently were in, in the mix for Shattenkirk. I think they saw the opportunity to – bring in him mm-hmm. at a at a bargain salary and add him on the right side. Uh, that leads me to believe that they're still open to maybe bringing in another defenseman because that bottom pairing without Travis Dermott for the first month of the season, and even when Dermott comes back, is a little scary. So I, I, I reiterate the names that I've talked about on, the, on my columns on Hockey Buzz, you know, Dan Girardi, uh, you know, Ben Lovejoy, Maybe even Dion Phaneuf might Dion, get a PTO Dion, or a one, year, yeah, uh, or or a one year contract. I mean, it's possible. And I, like I said, if they were open to Shattenkirk, maybe they'd be open to one of those veterans. Wow, guys. there's Callie Johansson, Phil Housley's out there, Andy Wasnews, Jeff, Jeff Finger, Jeffrey Finger is out there, Andy Wasnews, he's looking for a gig, Luke Shen, Aki, Aki, Aki Berg. Berger. <laughs> okay michael it's been fun uh the leafs convo lives on and on forever we'll be back soon okay buddy talk to you thanks Norm.